Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, as you come on into the uh, room, we will just let people jump on in as we uh, as we welcome our guests from around the world. Uh, literally from, we have people from Canada, we have people registered from Europe and Asia, um, and uh, it's great to, to uh, see folks on a summer day uh, slowly trickle into uh, our webinar. It's great to see everybody. Um, I'm going to uh, ask everybody um, just to, to a couple of things as you come in, and you should be able to see my screen. I'm going to introduce our wonderful guest in just a moment. But first and foremost, I want you to, in the chat function, in the chat function, I want you to uh, drop in your name, uh, where you are. And if you have, uh, um, if, you, if you're comfortable sharing what you do, and now you don't have to share a question at this point, we're going to get to questions as we go along, but what's your name, where are you, and what do you do? Uh, please uh, put that into the chat as we go along. Uh, welcome, uh, Jana. Welcome, Melisent. Nice to see you. Samantha, Sanjeev, Stuart, uh, Sue. It's nice to see all of you here so far. We have more people coming in. Um, I also am going to start, uh, as you are putting that into the chat, I'm also asking you the following question, and I'm going to just launch a poll. Um, I would love it if you can share. Um, if you've been thinking about writing a book, and uh, you can answer either yes, it's, uh, it's been a goal of mine, uh, kind of, or nah, I'm just interested in this conversation. So, uh, and then we'll, we'll just dive in. Let's just give everyone a few seconds to choose their answer here. Um, and we, it's interesting how this is populating. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So uh, we have folks, uh, I'm just going back to the chat and I'm gonna, we're gonna come back to this in just a minute. So I'm gonna dive in. First of all, my name is Nick Kindler. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the founder of Kindler and Company and at Kindler and Company, we help innovators become better communicators. I am a TEDx speaker and a coach. I've worked with thousands of global leaders. I'm the uh, president of the uh, chapter of uh, EO Toronto. I'm also a faculty on, on Singularity University, as well as the Growth Institute. Um, and I'm an, a lifelong entrepreneur and a consultant. I'm also the author, and we're gonna talk about authorship today, of the, word, the, the book, Impact, Simplify, Transform, and Perform Pitches and Presentations. And today at the end of the session, we're gonna give away three books to people that are actively involved in asking questions and doing that kind of thing, getting involved. Um, today is, called, uh, is one of our Living Impact webinars. And I'm just gonna quickly, very quickly, go through the rules of engagement. So we have some house rules when we host these programs. And the first is we don't want any bystanders. You're spending a little bit of time with us. We want you to get involved and we want you to encourage other people to get involved too. What that means is we want you to share. That's right, isn't that sweet? We want you to share your ideas, share your questions, share your thoughts. Um, we also want you to focus. And you know these things right here, these are what I would call a weapon of mass distraction. So put it at yourself on airplane mode, focus, turn off distractions, you're gonna get a lot from this. And, and also take your preconceived notions of, of what we are gonna be covering and kind of park them because you may gather insights that create a new perspective and new mindset. And finally, when you're asking questions, when you're getting involved, be bold, don't be shy, give yourself an, a, a, the in, not the out to, to put yourself forward. And finally, I want you to have some fun. That's what we do here at Kindler and Company. We create really wonderful learning experiences and uh, our gift back to our community is to bring amazing people uh, like yourselves and amazing speakers and experts like Jesse today uh, to and shine a light on them and their expertise. So, so we're going to talk about the path to publishing, and I want to take a moment and uh, and share with you a little bit about Jesse. Uh, first of all, before I do, um, I would I'm going to actually end my screen share, and what I want to do is I want you to think about 
getting involved. I want you to ask your questions, raise your hands. If you really want to ask a question that's complex and you don't want to put it into the Q&A, then raise your hand and say, I'd like to go on camera. We'll bring you on camera. Even if we're midway through the program, we want you to ask as many questions as you have, as you can think of. Last time we had so many questions, we ran out of time. So uh, don't hesitate. Now, um, Jesse. Jessie is, uh, has spent her entire career in books. She's, uh, prior to co-founding Page Two, she held several management roles in pu at publishing houses, including that of COO of D&M Publishers and the associate publisher at Raincoast Books. She holds a master's degree in publishing from Simon Fraser University, is an adjunct professor at the university as well, and she serves on the board of creative Creative BC, which is an organization devoted to supporting the growth of cultural industries. So let's do a warm welcome to our special guest, Jesse. Welcome. Thanks so much, Nick. I'm totally thrilled to be here, especially given the way you set the stage for this conversation. <laughs> I love it. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jesse, we have a, a lot of folks, um, uh, who, some people who are published authors, some folks who are thinking of publishing. Uh, we've got a lot of different uh, folks who are interested in all kinds of aspect of publishing. Um, and, and it seems to me, I'm gonna end the poll right now, but we would see that um, almost everybody participated. I, I'm gonna share the results with everybody and I'm gonna share them with you as well. Um, can you see these results? I just wanna make sure. So it looks like uh, of, the, of the group that we have here, half of the folks have this goal of writing a book. Um, and then a quarter of them are just uh, uh, interested, they're interested, but they, they've never really shared this. And I, that's kind of where I was at uh, when I met you. I was like, I think I might want to, but I don't know. And then there's folks who are just kind of interested in the subject. So let's let's talk about that in a moment. We're going to come back to um, this that kind of mindset of, I really want to do it, or should I do it? Let's come back to that, because I think it's really the crux of what we're here to talk about. Um, let's talk about you, though. Ha have you always loved books? Like, what was, what's your earliest memory of reading? I was really wanting to ask you, like, do you remember a first book that kind of got you into the love of reading? That's a great question. Um, one of the first books that I can vividly remember is The Secret Garden. And yeah. I think, um, I mean, that's, that's so that's a common experience, I think, for so many people. Uh, it's not just a children's book, of course, but so many of us encounter it as children. And there's something about, you know, the psychological drama of that experience that um, in that book that that I think would compel anyone I, that is there is a reason it's so universally beloved. And I mm. remember being really excited and impressed with myself that I could read something so long. We might all have that feeling of, you know, oh my goodness, I really can do this. And uh, so that's the book that I remember. And, and do, you, do you know how old, do you have an idea of how old you were when you finally read it? I think about seven or eight. That's wonderful. So, yeah. and that imprinted on you. Uh, did it open up the floodgates? Did you just kind of go book after book after that? Yeah, there yeah. there were a couple of things. It was one of the only things that I felt not only that I loved, but that I was also good at. I really retained language. I loved language. Um, I didn't retain numbers. I wasn't athletic. So I don't mean to suggest it was just a process of elimination, but really there was an element of gravitating towards uh, what I felt that I could really embrace and what I was aligned with. So before we talk about the path to publishing, what got you into publishing? So like you've spent most of your career in this area. How, how did you get pulled into it? I was, well, there was the love of books, but also the love of the idea of the book getting into the world. I was really fascinated by how that happens. How mm. does it happen that a book you know, lights us up and strikes fire and, and you know, reaches the audience that it should reach. And because I grew up in Quebec, speaking English and French and studying the books and the literature of both of those 
in both of those languages and then specifically of both of those cultures, I was so interested to think of how, how do some books you know, penetrate one market and not the other or which books transcend? So that really sparked an interest in the business side of it as well mm. as the library side of it and made me decide to go into publishing, uh, you know, not just as a book lover, but really as someone who wanted to think strategically about how to bring books to market. So um, you worked at a traditional publishing, a couple of them, before you launched uh, your company, Page Two. Um, and your your company has a different model than some of the, what some people might think as publishing. You know, there's a lot of talk about getting book deals and uh, proposals, and uh, this almost reverses it in a way. Is that correct? Or how would you position it? Uh, that's totally correct. What's so interesting is that what we talk about now is traditional publishing, the idea of there's the book deal, you you submit a proposal to a whole bunch of publishers, and then one publisher, you know, makes you an offer and then licenses your rights, and mm -hmm. then you present the manuscript and away they go. Um, that idea we think of as traditional, it's actually in the history of publishing quite recent. The model that we use at page two uh, is, is actually the most traditional, because historically, the kinds of books that really came to the fore were often, they were books that authors would um, fund themselves or they had patrons who would fund the projects. This idea of commercial publishing that if a book uh, is really great, it succeeds and then it, it achieves commercial success by virtue of the publisher's savvy choices and the author writing a good book and then that will just light fire in the marketplace. That's quite a recent concept and in practical mm -hmm. nonfiction, which is largely, you know, that the, that's the category that page two represents, that's not really, we don't see that as being um, the, narr the real narrative. From our mm -hmm. perspective, when we launched page two, we thought, what's the real narrative for publishing success among people who are experts in their fields and who are writing about that expertise? It's not about the publisher, the publisher's genius in, in choosing that author. It's actually about the author choosing themselves, um, building this ecosystem of expertise with publishing as one part of it, and then finding the right, the right partner to help get that book into the world in the best possible way. So we created a model that is a service model where we are basically the author is hiring us as their publisher the same way you'd hire an expert videographer an expert to support your speaking career an expert to design your website and yet so we're we bring to bear all of our deep expertise in publishing but we don't license the author's rights uh, the author mm -hmm. retains ownership of their work and then they retain also creative control among other things. Uh, and the last thing I'll say about the model that's kind of core, the author also earns all of the sales revenue. So while they pay us as the publisher to do the work, the earnings are firmly in the hands of the author. Oh, okay. So I did know all that, but I yeah. didn't know that it's actually the older model. Uh, to me, that was a, a learning, even though I've worked with you. Um, now let's switch gears. People are thinking about writing a book, or they've uh, they're they're considering it. It's a hidden, uh, maybe a secret dream of theirs. Um, let's talk about what makes a great. And your major focus is nonfiction. Uh, right. And so, what what makes a great nonfiction business book, in your mind? I like to think of each book as an entrepreneurial endeavor. This should speak to you and to many in your audience, I think, great entrepreneurs will appreciate what, what problem are they trying to solve for hmm. their, you know, for the end user. And a great authors in this category, business, or I, I, Nick, I'm gonna broaden it out a little bit, thinking about the diversity of subject matter experts who might attend this webinar. So anyone writing a work of practical nonfiction that's meant to really help solve a problem for their reader, whether it's in business and leadership or health and wellness, any other category, it's about what problem are you solving for your reader, A, and B, 
why are you the best person to write it? And if you can express those two things at the very heart and soul of your book, so conceptually, from the perspective of the title and the work, you have a winning yeah. combination there. So uh, I'm gonna be vulnerable here for a moment and I'm gonna ask a question with a little bit of a preamble, which is, okay. um, it took me a long time to get comfortable that I was, even though I have this expertise and I'm, I feel, yes, I'm knowledgeable, et cetera, but it took me a long time to kind of come to terms that this was the thing that I should do. Um, mm -hmm. So who should write one? How do you know if you're the right person to write a book? Um, I have two answers that, to that question. I think anyone who really wants to become, let's say a category owner, so, or a concept owner, you really want to become, uh, you know, <laughs> you really want to own the space of impact through pitches, presentations. You know, this is something, Nick, you, from my perspective as your publisher, I all, I knew you, I knew that you own this category, but until you, you are literally the, you literally wrote the book on it. There's that, I think we still have this sense that there's that for some people that missing piece and mm -hmm. a book can really be the cornerstone. It's not, it shouldn't be the only thing that you can't just put out a book and call yourself the expert on that subject. There's a whole ecosystem you need to have built of subject matter expertise, but the book is such an anchor. And I think we still are in the culture. I think we still really believe that and feel the difference between this and every other thing that you might put out. And, and so, just to clarify, right, I'm not talking about digital versus print. This is yeah. about the long form of a book and 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 the authorship as opposed to every other kind of more ephemeral piece of content you might put out. Sure, absolutely. Now, um, I'm gonna just pause and say to everybody uh, watching live, don't hesitate to drop in your questions um, into the Q&A, or if you have a question, you can raise your hand and we can also make you a temporary panelist to ask your question. So happy to happy to do that. But I do want to ask this, I want to go back to this. Um, how do you know it's book, book worthy? Like, mm -hmm. I, I had this idea, I chatted with you years ago. Um, I wrote a manuscript. And then I kind of hail married it over to you and said, that's the way it felt. Like, I don't know, like, is it, and, and you were very kind, but how did, how does somebody know if it's book worthy, their, their idea, their, um, their concepts? I think that the, the answer to that is also kind of the second part of my answer to your question of who should write a book. How do you know if you should write one? I think there's something about the long form that, people should really think about with with a lot of intention. So mm. I don't mean long form in the sense that it has to literally be a long book, but yeah. lo something that is long form content and that needs to be such, that needs to be so in order to, to paint a whole picture, let's say, of what you're trying to express, which is different from a blog post or a speech, or, you know, if you think about all of the other forms of content you might produce as an expert, what is it that actually needs to be presented in with where you need more time and space to make your argument? So that's, that's one answer. I often okay. will say, does, is this really a book or is it a magazine article? As readers, we all, we have all had that response to books. This actually mm -hmm. should have been an article, not a book, right? Mm -hmm. But I think, so I think that that's, that's really one thing to consider as well. I think it's important to think about the intersection of what, what's at the core of what you do um, and do you want to express it to the world in this, like it's really about planting your flag in this subject area, right? And yeah. do your readers need that? Do they need and want that? So planting the flag, the, the core idea, mm -hmm. uh, how do you, how do you get clear on that? Like, I think I, think I came with my idea prior to, but you, you and your team helped me get even clearer on it. But how do what's and we're going to dive into the process of publishing in a moment. But let's let's talk about that core idea and clarity of that. Uh, I think great 
expertise helps a lot. I think a lot of people, there, there's a lot of mystery around publishing and a lot of people think that a, a great book concept just comes fully formed and that if it doesn't, then somehow it's not right. That just mm -hmm. the penny should drop and everybody says, ah, I've worked, I mean, it's 20, I've been in the industry 25 years. I've seen some many scenarios where the actual core concept of a book or the beautiful title or the positioning didn't land until many, many months into a project. Those are still great books because the content was great. We just had to refine the positioning. It takes work and it takes a lot of expertise. So I would say, don't feel that you have to go it alone. Um, mm. Hire someone ideally whether it's a whether it's a publisher or if you don't know that you want to want to go with a publishing partner yet find an experienced book editor with deep expertise that will be worth every penny because it will set you up strategically to not only write the right book but also to, to have it positioned in the right way awesome uh we have a question from Jana Jana I see it I'm going to come to it after this next question, because I think it's going to piggyback after uh, on this one. So the first, my question is, so I had the privilege, everybody, of, of working with Jesse and her team at page two uh, from beginning to end. They read my manuscript and they, and, and right through to the actual launch of the book, the printing of it, every aspect, the design of it. So I know what I experienced, but I would love it if you could um, help everybody, because there's a whole bunch of folks that are interested here in doing this. Um, what's the process? Can you walk everybody through the process of from, from up here to out there publishing a book? Absolutely. And I'll speak broadly, Nick, because, you know, people might have, might be seeking different kinds of publishing experiences. So I'll speak to what are some of the commonalities. And okay. that, that early development process uh, that I was describing with an editor, that's off in the very beginning where you work with someone to really help refine your concept, build your outline, make sure that you have a really great plan for how your book is going to roll out. Uh, so that's often step one. And then you can go ahead and write it, sometimes with coaching, if you Sorry, need coaching. I, I just want to jump in on that one part, because it's a really key one, before yeah. they go into the coaching. This plan, can you, can you just give me just a little bit more detail on what a, a plan might include? Sure. You can think of it as a blueprint. Um, this is, It's basically, ideally, you have a document that, that is, acts like a book outline. So you will list your table of contents and, you know, map out the structure of the book. But I'd like you to think of it with a bit more depth, because an outline can still feel pretty uh, functional. I think within that blueprint or, print or plan, it's also great to have a working title and subtitle, to have your elevator pitch, that core concept. If you can't describe, describe it in one sentence, then the rest of the plan is going to be very diffuse. You're going to have a hard time building a really nice um, structure for your outline and for your content if you can't describe the book in a nutshell. So gotcha. some of those uh, some of those features that we call positioning features should go into that plan as well. Think of it as a business plan, right? You're envisioning your you have to distill your big idea into you know a few sentences ideally come name it, call it out. How are you going to market it and get it into the world? And also what's the what is the how do you build this how do you build this thing um i want to uh, go to jana's uh, question and then uh we'll continue on with this pro sorry was that were you done the question in terms of the process is that, that that's a key that's part? the starting point right but i'm yeah but we can pause there if you want to go to a question and then we can pick it up okay we'll come back we'll come back uh, jana asked would this model work if you've already started um, Jana says, we have edited copy and illustrations for a children's junior chapter book. Do you publish work for children? I need help moving forward. At page two, we do very little, very few children's books. Where we do kids' books, there it's very much in line with the profile of the author we work with on the adult side. So experts, 
who are publishing, writing and publishing books in their area of expertise, um, or experts who want to, who are mission driven, who are trying writing and publishing a children's book in pursuit of a particular mission, if that makes sense, something that they're they're working on in the world. So if those things are uh, in the mix in, in this case, then we most certainly could explore and discuss, but it, that's a little bit, th those that list is a bit smaller than our adult list. Okay, and and uh, I'm just, uh, I'm gonna do a bit of a spoiler alert later on. Uh, Jesse, we're gonna share a link for Jesse's organization where you can actually get a one-on-one -on -one uh coaching session on what you're where you're at um in terms of your your book so uh jenna just stay, stay tuned for that link to come through in a little bit um and we have a question from sue carr as well actually and melissa we have we've got a few uh questions um we'll jump to them and i'll come back to my next question later uh how much do you need from millicent uh hello millicent nice to uh, see you uh, on here uh how much do you need to already have figured out before approaching a publisher? It depends. It is a great question. It depends on what kind of publisher. Uh, if, if you want to pitch your book to what we're calling a traditional publisher, they expect you to have developed a fully formed proposal and usually several sample chapters before you start approaching them. In a model like page twos, we're often referred to as hybrid publishers because uh, there's a hybrid experience where we can both, we create you know, a beautiful professional, professionally produced book for you that sits beautifully on the shelf next to any excellent traditional publishers, but in a way where you have more creative control and often you retain the rights. Um, and mm -hmm. so, so in our model, it's a service model, which means that we see it as our responsibility to meet you where you are. And so as an author, if you're part, part way through your manuscript and you've hit a point where you just don't know what to do or you need more support before you go, uh, before you go forward, then you can seek out a publisher like page two and we can help get you to a, a finished draft so, and then take it from there. So it, I can't speak for all hybrid publishers, but in our case, we'll take authors such as yourself, Nick, where you have a draft or authors who just have a concept and will help do that development work to get you to the draft and beyond. And, um, and this kind of links to uh, actually a couple of things. Sue Carr has um, a, a question as well, but she said earlier, she loves the model that you're talking about, the service model. And then she just noticed that a book on her desk uh, is a page two hard copy book, Julie Alice's Big Gorgeous Goals. So uh, that's uh, that's a nice example as, as of the, the copy sitting next to uh, uh, any other book. And, and it doesn't matter who is the publisher, it's the end result of getting it out into the world. I mean, sorry, I don't want to belittle the quality of publishers. It, obviously, you want to choose carefully. But her question is, what are your thoughts on a book that is a collection of articles versus a deep dive on a single aspect? Well, that's a great question. And thanks, Sue, for calling out Julie's book. It is a big, gorgeous book, and, and I love it. Um, in terms of the, the content, but my suggestion is that the form should always follow the content and the audience. So I would say, think about what it is that you want to write. What does your audience need? And what is the best form in which to deliver it to them? I was just in a concept meeting with, with an author who, who was saying, uh, it's in the mental wellness space. And uh, the co-authors were saying, well, we want it to be really episodic. We want it to be lots of storytelling, lots of different episodes so that it'll entertain the reader and keep them really engaged. And I was saying, that sounds great, but what is the core concept that you're trying to achieve? Is, is, it be is, is there something that's actually better delivered in, through principles, through a framework? Do you need deep dive research? Mm -hmm. What do what does your audience and readership really need in order to for you to get the message across? Once you determine that, then I think you can determine should it be episodic, should be an should it be an anthology, a collection, or does it need to be 
long form narrative content. So, mm -hmm. so really free yourself up first to think about the concept itself in your reader and then map out the form and, and look for examples. I always recommend look for examples of books you love and think about why you love them, not just about the information that they contain, but put your strategist hat on and start to look through. You know, uh, one of the things, so I'm a bit biased, but one of the things I love about Nick's book is <laughs> it's true to, and this is what we try to reflect in our author's work, true to Nick's own and Kindler and Company, to your own ethos, dynamic, uh, accessible, friendly, you want people to engage, show up and have fun. Well, this isn't an accident that you've got some really dynamic, playful display type throughout a book that otherwise could have just been heavy, dense information, right? You, this, we're, this is us mirroring Nick's own ethos and personality and that of his company. So, so when you're reading books by authors you love, think about what's the, the delivery and the structure of this content, not just design, but how is it structured and how is that speaking to me? So that might give you some ideas for what you want to do with your own content and the structure of it. And it's funny, I remember writing that thing and and you you and your team coaching me and asking me questions like, which books do you like? And I remember I'd been reading Atomic Habits by James Clear, James mm -hmm. Clear, I think, That's right. and which um, he was very specific. It wasn't about playful type or anything, but very prescriptive around this is what you need to do at the end of this chapter right and I I kind of loved it like I was like oh this is I want to learn these habits I want to take this home I want to do something about that and that was where you you kind of encouraged me to go for it yeah exactly at the end of each chapter you've got homework literal homework for your for your reader and that's that's a beautiful guide for your reader sorry to keep using you as the example Nick but it, it's such a good example where that would have come through a conversation. I'm sure you. this is something that you knew was useful to your reader, but it also gives that added um, you know, sort of memorable experience to your reader at the end of each chapter for that information to really sink in. So, so that's, that's form, but it's, it's bringing the, the content beautifully through a certain form. There's a, so many questions I want to ask you, and I'm kind of jumping back here for a moment because I looked at that 25% of people. Uh, there's only a couple, but we only we we had more people join afterwards. People who uh, we did a poll for those who missed it, um, and we asked who is thinking of writing a book, and a number of people said they're kind of, but I've never really shared this. And so, how do we get? I know it's not your job, Jesse, to get people over the starting line, like to the starting line, even. But how would you encourage people to, to move past that psychological barrier of whatever it is, it's I'm not worthy, I don't have enough experience, I don't feel confident. What's your advice to those folks? Well, it is my job sometimes very literally to help coach yeah. people through that. It's incredible. You you can't imagine the the number of people who are true subject matter experts top of their game in in every way who when it comes to writing a book they feel somehow not worthy of being an author and i oh, think I can, I can totally i think i can think of at least one person yeah, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's amazing to me because i think that that's a le leftover a legacy of this idea this the mystification of being an author you know, tracking back to what I said earlier about where the publishing landscape has evolved in the commercial space, this idea that somehow someone who's worthy of being an author, it's because you the publisher chooses you and then as if the commercial landscape chooses you too. Mm. I, I just think that it, it might be different if you're writing a work of um, literary fiction, let's say, where that ha where you're following a certain literary tradition and there are gatekeepers when it, and people who will measure the quality of the work. Even that is very subjective. However, I feel that in practical nonfiction, um, authorship is really about that idea of planting your flag. It's about a really excellent expression of your subject matter expertise. So that question of that I posed earlier, why are you the best possible person to write this book? If you can really stand in those shoes and, and answer that question for yourself and for your audience, 
you have every right to and deserve to be the author of that book. And, and that's our ethos and our feeling at page two. There's no, there's, we like to demystify that. The key is to do it well, to get the right partner, the right experts to support you in doing it well. And if you are truly the expert and the authority, think about the word author and authority. You're the authority mm -hmm. in your subject area. Putting that in book form is not a mystery. You just, it's just like, think of it like any other professional endeavor you deeply care about. The big speech, the big, you know, the big keynote, the big presentation, the big white paper you've drafted, you pursue excellence in every form. The book is one more. It's not a mysterious outlier that only some people should get to do. Um, I'm going to go back to the process because we kind of stopped after the project plan. And I know there's a lot of steps after that. I also want to say to everybody, there's some great questions. Keep dropping them in. We, we're, you know, this is the whole reason for us to do this is to answer any questions that you may have. Do not be shy. So, uh, Jesse, going back to that, once you've got your project plan or your plan in place, what's mm -hmm. next? So then if you want to pitch your book to publishers, once you drafted your proposal, that's when you would pitch to either an agent who would then pitch to publishers, or you could take that proposal and your sample chapters and go and, uh, and, and pitch those to an uh, directly to publishers, depending on your strategy. So that's one, one way to go about it. If you're working with a publishing services company or a hybrid publisher or you're self-publishing and you're going to, you know, do the work yourself and put it up online for people to read, mm -hmm. then the next step in the process would be to start thinking about design, marketing, and sales and distribution all at the same time. So mm -hmm. Uh, which sounds a bit overwhelming, but if you think about it on a Gantt chart, for example, you can move certain parts of the process while starting to, to plant the seeds for the others at the same time. So you, you start working on your manuscript, hopefully with the help of a really great editor. And while you're doing that, you can start developing your marketing strategy. And I don't want to over make that overly complex. For some people, the marketing strategy might be I want to give this to every every corporate leader in my space. It's a mar it's a book that's meant to be a marketing vehicle. For some people, it might be I'm going to take six months off work and go on a big tour and you know do do all, do all kinds of things. So whatever your marketing strategy is, it should start early in the process while you're working on the production of the book. And you also want to determine your sales and distribution strategy. Which if you're working with a traditional publisher. They, that's just in their hands. They, they will handle that and they'll make all the decisions around that and execute it. Uh, but if you, if you are self-publishing or you're working with a hybrid publisher, you will have a say in how does this book get into the world? Is it online? Is it in stores? Is it going to be an ebook too? Is, will there be an audiobook? So you can think yeah. about the formats as well. And then while you're doing that, you want to start thinking about the design of the book of the print edition and then design of the ebook will flow from that. So essentially those are kind of the core components of the book really drastically reduced. Uh, but once you've put those, the, you know, you've identified those different um, parts of your strategy, then the rest is managing it through the project. And I remember um, I launched my book in heart of COVID, like no one was getting together no one was seeing each other. Nothing was open. Um, and so uh, the question of, of like, um, one of the questions was, do you, do you want to put it in stores? Like, uh, you know, the, the airport stores, and which and I always said, I'd love to, but there's a, there doesn't seem to be a real need for that at this moment. So uh, you look at what's going on in the world, where, what kind of book it is, the audience uh, that you're aiming for, and does the approach or investment make sense at the time? Exactly. Well said. Um, one of the questions from Millicent uh, is, what does the support cost um, with a hybrid, a minimum for a hybrid publisher? Yeah. I'd say a minimum, what I've seen in the landscape uh, for a good hybrid publisher with deep expertise is usually about 15 to 20,000 from beginning to end. And just as a point of reference, if you think about this, 
Uh, I don't know if anyone has hired a deeply experienced editor or a, a publishing expert who is doing the work to help you develop and position the book. Sometimes the cost of that can be in the realm of $10,000 as an example. That mm -hmm. is money and the money and time well spent in the sense that it that is a deep investment of time on the editor's part and the author's usually many months of work and but it so if you factor that one piece of the whole experience of publishing into your cost assessment of the value of of the services you are uh, anticipating from your hybrid publisher that that's one way to think about it it how does that hybrid publisher package all of the services and at what price. And so mm. uh, what I'm trying to get it, get at is that if you see, there are some hybrid publishers who will say, we'll do all of this for a relatively small price tag. One thing to watch out for is, is what is the depth and quality of those services? And is that what you're looking for? Sometimes it might be so, because that, that's exactly what you need. But for some people who are looking for um, deeper expertise and really a hands-on boutique style experience that's very high touch, then that's a different, that's more page two where we sit in the landscape. Uh, and so the, the service level is higher and the price tag is higher. So I'd say realistically, you will find very much lower cost options, but realistically 15 to 20 in the mid range is um, I think what that that's sort of the starting point. And, and uh, Melissa has a follow-up, which is, do hybrid, hy hybrid publishers uh, offer ghostwriter services to support the writing? Yes, many do. Page two does. And the key to that is the matchmaking. It's our job to find the absolute perfect match uh, for, to get someone who can really represent your voice through that book. Yeah. And, and I just want to speak to this. I, I um, as... Uh, as somebody who recommends to a lot of um, experts that I work with that they should write a book, because sometimes I'm working with these individuals and I just get my, my my brain is blown away by the big ideas and the change that they can make in the world. And you need to put this into not just on stage or on video, but you need to get it out there. And they say, well, I don't have time. Like, I, I don't have the time to do it. Um, and And I guess what I'm trying to say is there's no shame. Like, there's no shame in getting coached through and somebody supporting you to get this out into the world because it's still very important. I'm so glad you said that. I did a whole panel on the ghostwriting experience and I was trying to express, I think that this is another piece of that legacy puzzle, this idea that it's not a real book if you didn't write every single word. When on the contrary, in a ghostwriting experience, you're still being interviewed. You are the one talking everything out. It's your idea, your content, and besides which, you will sign off on every single word. And the, a good ghostwriter should be writing, should be putting your words just in the right context, right? And and so it is a time-saving experience. And I think it's absolutely, not only is there no shame, I think it's a really smart move for authors who want to get it done, but who don't have the time. And, and um, a comment from Melissa, and also most people can't possibly believe all these experts write their own books. <laughs> uh, well, and it's food. good on them, right? Good on them. Well, they good build them. businesses around them, right? They, yeah. they churn them out, or some of them churn them out, and some of them have processes, and some of them spend time, like they block off periods of time every year or every other year to get something done or they have teams of people that work with them to help them develop you know it's there's different models um sorry i'm i'm, I'm kind of jumping in there but my i did want to ask you um if there was a book on publishing that you would recommend i have three i hope okay. you don't want it one of them does happen to be a page two book but it's utterly, it's the utterly the, or the right answer to this question. A.J. Harper, a book called Write a Must Read. Uh, she is a brilliant publishing expert, editor, content developer, and she's written the book on how to take how to write the most compelling nonfiction book that's right for its audience in the market. And we, with AJ's permission, we have borrowed many of her concepts 
in our process at page two wow. in how we how we help coach our authors. And she's just utterly brilliant. I can't say enough about this book. Write a must read. It just Write a must read. Okay. AJ Harper. AJ Harper. I also love Stephen King's classic book on writing. Absolutely. High five. <laughs> it, one one of my favorite Stephen King books, period, but also one of my favorite books on on writing. Yeah. Well, enough said. It's no, uh, it's not, not enough said. I think it's worth who wasn't, who wasn't uh, transformed by that. Yeah. So just um, Stephen King wrote that after he had a terrible accident. I don't know if, like he, and it's worth saying that it's semi autobiographical but he talks about the practice of writing and whether you're a fan of the genre that he yeah. is yeah. known to be the master of, of you know, horror or thrillers, yeah. uh, it's a, it's a wonderful read and, uh, and a good one. What else? You said there were three. Yes. The last yeah. one is by a publishing consultant called Jenny Nash. Um, she is also a book coach and she, she wrote blueprint for a book. And that is just an excellent uh, reference tool. When I talk about the blueprint, that is a really nice way of thinking about, you know, she just helps to distill it and helps you map out what is the foundation of that book and how to get it done. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, we'll, we'll capture those and drop them into post-communication for everybody that was here and those who uh, are watching this on replay. Um, so those links will be in, in the YouTube link, et cetera. Um, so thank you for those. Uh, Sanjeev's got a great question, and it's actually been on my mind or a version of this, Sanjeev. Um, there are many advantages to being an author besides the revenue stream, uh, for example, planting your flag in your space. Mm -hmm. But curious about the revenue upside versus the risks. Are most books profitable? I have my own perspective, but over to you. Most books industry-wide are not profitable. That goes for traditional publishers, that goes for self-publishers, everything in between. The, there are many reasons for that, and we don't probably have enough time today to get into them, but I will say traditional publishers have a model where they work in volume, they sell across a whole list, and they bank on, they, they rank their titles and they bank on the A titles selling a lot of copies and kind of leading the, the charge on the whole list. They also mm. publish a lot of loss leaders for strategic reasons. So the individual titles are often not profitable in and of themselves. That's one, one piece. On the, on the self-publishing or the hybrid publishing side of things, we look at profitability with our authors often, especially if that's something that is really important to them. And we never rely on profitability based on retail sales alone. That is really hard to achieve for, for many different reasons. The idea of the book just getting out into the landscape and you know you cross your fingers and see who finds it is outdated, uh, especially in an environment where most of us are buying books online that happens through search and you go and you often know what you're searching for. So guess what? Mm -hmm. You need to have heard about this book through the author's marketing and sales efforts. So we like to look at from a profitability standpoint, what role is this book playing within your ecosystem? Are you able to sell a lot of copies directly to organizations? Some of our authors fund the entire project based on a couple of bulk sales that they're going to make to organizations. Will this book help you uh, price your speaking higher? Many of our authors come to us saying, I can instantly increase my speaking fee based on having this book alone, let alone what it might actually sell on a per copy basis or getting the, the desired consulting gig because that book got into the hands of the HR manager at your target organization. So I don't mean to disregard or to be dismissive of the idea of book sales in the retail market. We pay a lot of attention to that too, where the strategy requires it or the author, you know, the authors in that position to want to try to achieve that in the bookstore landscape. But those other pillars are often equally, if not more important when it comes to profitability. That's the reality of books. And I'll just add from a personal perspective, it is one of many assets that my business owns. Yes. And 
Uh, and, and if you look at assets from anything from a PowerPoint deck that you use or a template to the website um, that you've designed to um, uh, any tools that you use to kind of move your business forward or to actually for clients to use, um, it is um, yet another valuable tool that uh, has more than uh, more than paid for itself uh, over the last two years. During a time, I'll add, when you know COVID made things much more difficult to to navigate in in this arena for me. So uh, I can't I can and I'll, I'll add one more thing. Sorry, it's now Nick standing on his uh, soapbox, but I will say one last thing, which is that um, it gives you so much more to share when you finally articulated everything into a very clear, coherent, uh, long form message. It gives you a lot of um, multiple uh, asset development opportunities. That's beautifully said. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to, I've got to ask a couple of questions uh, that are less about books uh, and publishing because uh, we're, we're almost out of time. And I do want to share something we've got the uh, we're going to draw for the books and, and I want to share a few things with our group. Uh, first of all, you, you are such a kind, friendly person. Every time I've worked with you, it's been warm and welcoming. And like uh, when I was out in Vancouver, we had drinks and I could say to people, I had drinks with my publisher, as I said to you earlier. So one of those things that you never get to say, but you never seem angry or frustrated. What makes you angry? <laughs> um, what makes me angry? A lack of curiosity and humility. I think those two things really go hand in hand. And I'm mm -hmm. so, so lucky to work with people who, in many cases, it's almost built into the fabric of who you are. The kinds of people we set out to serve, Nick, such as yourself, you come you come curious. You come with humility. Not just about being an author, just but about the process itself. Similarly, we come curious about you and, and with humility about your subject matter expertise and what we can learn from you. I the So I'm answering your question by saying what lights me up and the opposite of that makes me angry. When people it's, such come a nice barely... way, it's such a nice way to answer <laughs> the angry question. Um, uh, we are, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to um, ask you one more question, which is, I think you have an offer for everybody who is interested in potentially learning more. What, what, what do you, what, what's your offer? Absolutely. So we have an excellent uh, business development association, uh, associate rather on our staff called Madeline Manson. And she is going to make herself available to the first uh, 10 participants on a first come for serve basis would like to block off a 20 minute meeting in her calendar. And so we're gonna share the link for that to have an exploratory discussion about your book concept and whether page two might be a good fit for you. So anyone, by the way, is welcome to reach out through our website, anyone, if you want to fill out the form and we look at every single submission. But in this case, we wanted to offer a 20 minute window to chat directly and personally with Madeline about um, your questions about publishing and about uh, a potential fit here. Yeah. Wonderful. And that link is in there. So take advantage of it. I, I, I can only speak uh, highly of my experience working with page two. I, uh, my only regret of the whole thing is I wish I'd done it years earlier. So, um, and I've got another book in me that I've been cultivating and, and mulling over. And uh, when it's ready to go, I know the first people I'm going to call is going to be Jessie and, and her team. Um, I want to just say a few things before we wrap up. I've got a couple of messages. First, I want to thank Jessie. Um, uh, I, I, your time is valuable. Your insights are valuable. Uh, your team and your service is valuable. So as a gesture of thanks, uh, we're at Kindler and Company, we're donating uh, to support the United Nations global sustainability goal of quality education. And for those of those, those of you who aren't familiar with the United Nations identified 17 global sustainability goals. And um, as a learning and coaching company, um, we are going to be targeting number four, which is ensuring inclusive and equitable quality education. We're working with a company called B1G1 to dive into this problem. So every 
program like this that we deliver will donate uh, 365 days of literacy and business training for women in Uganda. So we go very specific. And that is on behalf of your time. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you so um, much. I'd love it if people could just give a thumbs up or a, uh, something in the chat to show your appreciation to Jesse. Um, I'm also going to share my screen. I have one more thing that I'd like to share with everybody um, before we wrap up. So stick around because we're going to give away some books. Some of you are, are, are uh, multiple. Um, uh, you've been here a few times, so and you may have even won a book. Uh, my question to you is, and I'd like you to drop this into the chat, what do you take away from today? What do you take away from today? You write that into the chat. And while you're doing that, we're also going to share that we uh, recognize that you're busy. You're a leader that probably has a lack of time, uh, a lack of time that leads to a lack of clarity in your messaging, uh, which might actually impact your leadership uh, and your ability to communicate well and engage your audiences. And as I shared earlier, we have a number of programs that we provide that help leaders um, communicate with impact and translate their innovations. Our next webinar is actually going to be a virtual workshop on September 21st at 1 p.m. Eastern time. It's called the Communicate with Impact Workshop. It's gonna be interactive. Uh, it's about three hours in length. I highly encourage you to join. Um, this is actually something we never ever offer in a virtual setting um, that isn't for an enterprise level client. So we do this all the time for our, our executive clients and, and their teams, but we don't offer it. Um, and that link I believe is going in, um, uh, in the chat as well. So um, let's now make sure that's, oh, there it is. Thanks, uh, Crystal, for dropping that in. All right, we have uh, a few people that are here. Um, we're gonna do the draw. Uh, Crystal, can you give me the three names of the winners who are getting copies of the book today? We'll drop it in. Oh, Millicent, Jenna, and Yinka. If you, uh, Chris, if you message uh, Crystal directly, crystal at kinlearncompany.com, We'll make sure that we get you a hard copy sent to your address. Um, that is it, folks. Uh, I love these sessions. They are uh, such a privilege for me to have spent time with people like Jesse, to have people spend time with uh, people from around the world. Um, really appreciate uh, all of your attention and wonderful questions. And uh, Jesse, once again, thank you for your time. So good to see you. Thank you so much. It was a, a delight for me. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you in the next webinar in September. Have a great rest of your August.